The Lord be with you. Welcome this morning to Christ Lutheran Church. This is the first Sunday after Christmas. This is also the feast of St. John the Evangelist. And uh, our text today will be uh, examining the writings of St. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, what the Lord had worked through his pen and through his life. Um, as usual, everything that you need for worship will be on the screen for you. So we begin with the Office of Matins. O Lord, open my lips.
A reading from Revelation, chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to know, to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin." If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive, our, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from John chapter 21. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had been reclining at table close to him, and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not yet was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who was bearing witness about these things and, ha and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself 
could not contain the books that would be written. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this day the Church celebrates the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, one of the Lord's first disciples, a fisherman. For some reason he has the nickname Son of Thunder. He's one of the most prominent of the twelve He's in the inner circle along with Peter and James. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we count him as the author of the Gospel of John, the first, second, and third letters of John, and the Revelation to St. John. Because he is one of the original twelve, those who received the Spirit in the upper room on Easter and who was sent to make disciples by baptizing and teaching, the church calls him by the title Apostle. Because he wrote one of the Gospels, he is also called an Evangelist. His Gospel is one that everybody loves, and with good reason. He tells long, detailed stories, some of which the other three Gospels don't include at all like the resurrection of Lazarus, the changing of water into wine at Cana, and the coming of Nicodemus by night. Meanwhile, he skips the birth narrative and the institution of the Lord's Supper. He ends his gospel with the reading for today, the bit about Peter looking back and seeing him. And then the Lord's enigmatic words about John's remaining until the Lord comes. He wants to make sure that we know that Jesus does not mean that he's not going to die. Now, the main point in this scene at the end of John's gospel is that Jesus knows what he's doing. Now, there is a pretty clear law application to this, isn't there? Because Peter gets a bit of a rebuke. He wants to know, hey, Jesus, what's going to happen to John? The Lord's response, paraphrased, is a favorite line of mothers the world around. Mind your own business. What is his fate to you, Peter? You follow me. Now, even as we are not to worry, we are also to avoid comparing ourselves to one another. We all bear a cross, and all of our crosses are custom-made, One is not interchangeable with another. They're not the same as another. But no one is spared. We all carry a cross. Maybe it's a different size or a different shape than another's, but we all have one. We're tempted to look at others and say, man, they've they've really got it easy. They don't have it as hard as I've got it. They don't know what it means to suffer. I know what it means to suffer, but those people don't know. Those Christians don't know. It's tempting, isn't it, to think that? Look at John. Of the twelve, he is the only one, according to tradition and and written histories, that did not die the death of a martyr. Why doesn't he get tortured the way Peter does? Why isn't he being fed to lions? Is it because Jesus loved John more than Peter? 
Or is John maybe, I don't know, better at being a Christian? More winsome? Why do our friends have it so easy anyway? Why do our mothers prefer our brothers, for that matter? You can see in all of these questions the seeds of envy. Now, first of all, most of them begin with suppositions that aren't even true. But nonetheless, you see in this envy. Envy is one of the stupidest, most useless, self-sabotaging, unfulfilling of all the sins. Envy is discontentment or unhappiness simply because someone else is happy. It's the opposite of that wonderful German word schadenfreude. Now schadenfreude means to be happy when someone else is sad. There are whole YouTube videos about this, laughing at people who fall off their skateboards and jump off of boats and things. That's schadenfreude. This is the opposite. This is being angry or sad when someone else is happy. We're sinfully happy when a coworker gets a flat tire or when someone reveals that they're sick and they're not going to be there the next day and you don't like them very well. Now that is evil. It's not becoming of a Christian. Our sadness when that same coworker, though, gets praise from the boss, that's also evil. Both things are out of line with the Lord's command that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Peter is on the very brink of his headship of the church on earth. He is the chief apostle. He's always listed first in the lists of the apostles, and very, very often he speaks on behalf of the apostles. But in typical Peter fashion, he asks a very childish question. Jesus, for his part, does not play Peter's game. John does suffer. He suffers in ways that are unique to him and uniquely painful. What may not have been painful to Peter, or at least that which Peter might have looked or thought looked easy, is devastating to John. Whatever John suffers is precisely the chastisement from the Lord that John needs. The Lord's special bond with St. John and his sparing of John of violent martyrdom does not mean that he loved Peter less than John. It means that the Lord loves John and Peter in just the way that each of them needed. He loves them precisely counting every hair on their heads, knowing the unique potential and goodness of each who is made in his image. The Lord does not love with a generic love that treats all of us as exactly identical with one another as though he doesn't know who we are. We parents don't love with an identical love either. We love all of our children, yes, but we love different things about each of our different children, and we love what makes them different. And so does the Lord love us. And so does the Lord love John and Peter. He knows them with a knowing, deliberate love, a personal love. And he loves you. He loves you even more than your mothers do. He even knows you better than your mother knows you. And yet he still loves you better than your mother loves you. He's seen what you do in secret. And he still loves you like this. So don't look about for what he does do or doesn't do to and for other people, and especially other Christians. Instead of envy, cultivate sympathy. You suffer. And very often you suffer precisely for the name of Jesus. Don't you think your brothers and sisters in Christ also suffer for the name of Jesus? Maybe in the same way that you do, and maybe in different ways. But in either case, that should cause us to be sympathetic, cause us to have empathy for one another. They have it worse than you know. They may not let you, let you know exactly how much they suffer or how they suffer, but they do. No one 
Not one gets out of this life unscathed. For the servant is not above the master. If our Lord was treated shamefully by sinners and mocked and spit upon, lied about, don't you think that we will also suffer some of these same things? This time of year, or at least maybe a couple of weeks ago, we were getting lots of Christmas letters from everybody. And they're wonderful. And everyone else is getting Christmas letters from their family, and you get lots of Christmas letters telling about what's happened over the last year. Usually, not always, but usually, those Christmas letters will gush about the good things that happened and minimize or just omit the bad things. It's tempting then to see that and think, well, their year was all good and my year was both good and bad and more bad than I care to think about. Well, so was their year too. Most of us don't put forth how bad things are. And that's not a bad thing, but it means that we should understand that one another, fellow Christians, we suffer. And that suffering is often hidden and only known to the one suffering and to God. Don't be fooled by Christmas letters, and especially don't be fooled by social media. Most people, not all people, but most people, will put on social media the things that are good in their life, and the things that are bad in their life they don't make public. Now, I don't blame them for that one bit. I personally don't feel like putting all the bad things in my life out there for everyone to see either. But that's exactly it. Most people don't publish all the bad things that they're going through. Most people don't publish all the suffering they're going through, which means that if you take these things at face value, Christmas letters, social media, public personas of people, you're tempted to think, why am I suffering, but they're not? This is what Peter thought about John. Why am I going to be doing all this suffering, Jesus? And what about John? What's he going to get? You see, this is envy. It's self-destructive. It's not edifying. It doesn't bring people together. It divides them. It doesn't make us better people. It makes us worse. It makes us miserable. And for no advantage and no benefit whatsoever. This is, this is totally from the devil. It's all bad and no good. It's only cons and no pros. There's no good reason to be envious. But of course, our flesh doesn't need a good reason to be envious. It's prone to envy. This is why we need Jesus. The fact is, there's probably some psychological study somewhere that shows that the more a person boasts in a Christmas letter, probably the worse their year was, and the more dysfunctional their family is. When you encounter that kind of behavior, let it call you to compassion, to sympathy, to pity, not to anger. Imagine how sad a man's life is if he feels like he has to brag about it. Dear Christian, you, like Peter, follow Jesus. Now, at the end of John's Gospel, there's kind of a defense of his writing here and his other writings as well. Even as Peter doesn't need to know everything about either John's fate or frankly, even his own fate, but simply needs to follow Jesus. So we're also told that we don't need to know every detail of everything Jesus said and did between the time that he was born in Bethlehem and the time he ascended into the clouds. There are obviously large gaps of history that simply are not recorded in those four Gospels, chiefly between the time that the Holy Family returns to Nazareth and the time that Jesus shows up to be baptized by John. There's only one incident between those two things, and that's when Jesus is in the temple, when he's 12. Well, obviously Jesus was saying and doing things then, and in the three years of his public ministry, he was saying and doing things also. And we don't know what they are. And the Holy Spirit, through his servant, St. John, reminds us, we don't have to know what they are. What we have is enough, at least for now. It's enough for faith. It's enough for life. We need to know 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We need to know that Jesus Christ is glorified on the cross, where he reveals himself for us according to his mercy. And we need to know that Jesus is he who is raised from the dead for the forgiveness of our sins. We don't know what the next year is going to bring for us. We don't know if things are going to get worse or better in general, or even worse or better just for us. Days of persecution could be coming, or not. But so also do crosses come from far more sources than just tyrannical governments. Crosses come from all kinds of places. John's slow and lonely death might have been worse than Peter's upside-down crucifixion. There is, at least in in some versions of traditional history, an account that John survived being boiled alive in oil. Now that's real suffering. Maybe Peter's crucifixion upside down was more merciful than that. That's why we don't compare crosses to one another. What we know is this, though. There will be sorrow. So don't be surprised when it comes. There will be heartache. Don't be caught off guard and don't think, well, because I have heartache and because I'm suffering, this must mean that Jesus has forgotten me or he loves me less than these other saints who don't seem to be suffering. That's the way of Peter here. That's the way of envy. This is not the way of those who follow Jesus. But whatever comes, whether it's bad or good, God will use it for good. He will teach us through our suffering, that this world is not our home. So don't get too cozy. Don't get too attached. Because all of this is going to pass away. This world will go away. And we learn that most clearly in the revelation of Jesus Christ that's given to St. John. We're going to learn that this is not our home. This is only a place of a temporary sojourn. We don't belong here. We're not of this world. But while we're in this world, Jesus will continue to teach us to follow him. Because Jesus didn't really belong here either. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him and believed in his name, he gave them the right to become the children of God. He came unto his own to get his own, to pull them out of this world, to bring them into the promised land that they were waiting for. So you, follow Jesus. Now, following Jesus is mostly a passive activity. Hear his word. Receive the holy sacrament. Be forgiven. This is not about Jesus describing for you the path that you must walk to get to heaven. You don't find your own way to heaven. The Bible is not a roadmap of instructions. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He paved the way, and he leads the way. You, you follow him, who is your advocate with the Father, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of earth, the propitiation for your sins. Follow him. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Merciful Lord, cast the bright beams of your light upon your church, that we, being instructed in the doctrine of your blessed apostle and evangelist John, may come to the light of everlasting life. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.